I have uh, all three faculty members here uh, with me, and uh, if somebody would like to uh, put their hand up, ask a first question, uh, we'll get going. Well, I, I actually would like to have the website for Bruce Parkinson's science. I, I want my grandkids' science teachers to know about this project. <laughs> All right, well, it's actually branched out. There's multiple things now, but the, the original one is called www.thesharkproject.org. Say it again. It's thesharkproject.org. Okay, great. Thank you. Address to this gentleman over here. Uh, how much work is being done by you know, University of Wyoming and other places on uh, on harnessing and cleaning up the stacks of coal? Which you know we had all this coal, and why can't we make do a lot of research and make burning of coal help us generate maybe even hydrogen and water? The answer is there is a lot of research in what they call clean coal. And part of that would be what's called carbon sequestration. So that is you separate the carbon dioxide from the blue gas, and then you put it either in an underground formation, like where you took out natural gas or something like that, where there's empty space, and formations where it doesn't leak to the surface. And some place where you take a natural gas out of is one of those places. That's why it's there. It didn't leave. Uh, so that, that's a big... Uh, research effort by the Department of Energy, and it's successful in places where you have the right geology, but then it becomes difficult if you have to pipe that carbon dioxide to a place that has the right geology, that adds a lot of cost. And also they've noticed that when they do that, that, that some of the same problems with fracking, you mess with the underground formations and the pressure, you can get little earthquakes, you can get actually the earth rising a little bit in places. So, I, you know, it's definitely something that should be looked into. I'd say we have to look at all of the above. And so being able to burn coal without having CO2 released would be a good thing. Furthermore, though, actually, you can convert coal to hydrogen directly. But you do produce some CO2 when you do that. You take carbon plus water, you can go to CH4 plus carbon dioxide. And so we know how to do that, and if you want to get into a cleaner room and thick but then what I would like to say, well, if you're going to do that, we'd like to make the hydrogen from sunlight and water, and then you can add it to the carbon to make methane, and we know how to use methane as fuel, and we got pipelines for that. That's then adding a little, you know, extra energy to the coal that's not going to, you know, again, you're getting two waters when you burn it again. But again, not totally sustainable. Thank you. Yeah. What kind of a timeline does the Shark Project have? What should we expect? See, it's been going for about five years, but it's we have, we have kind of, we, we run into kind of a cap in how much support we get. Uh, you know, so that I tell the story about how I was going to, you know, either choose the outreach or a company. But then the joke was on me. Once this got to be a decent-sized project, it was like running a company. <laughs> we had supply chains, customer support, shipping and receiving, all these things. And we had no capital to do that because we weren't the company. And so yeah, we kind of ran into a cap where we've been all done with volunteers so far. And once you get enough sites and there's enough people wanting parts or advice or it's all, you know, product support, basically, you just don't really have the resources, and nobody's quite stepped up to do this work. But there are options, too. There's a lot of projects, just as I'd hoped, that people, you know, this was just the first idea, and some of the kids themselves are doing variations and coming up with simpler ways to do it, and, and those, some of those are now based at Caltech. They have a, a, a new idea based on this. They're, they're promoting that's very similar. Instead, they don't use a laser, they use LED arrays to do the, the And we don't use printers, we use pipetting of drops. Which, but the printers, the current feeding of them was a little bit tricky sometimes. So anyway, it's expanding in a lot of ways. So it's not all one size fits all, and it's not all in one place anymore. Um, Bruce, thank you for your presentation on climate change. And, um, and I really applaud um, 
the realism and, the, and frankly, the alarmism of some of your projections into the future. You know, these, these curves are supposed to be turning down, and, and they're all going up. And so we're, we're, we're going backwards, um, year by year, month by month. Uh, I do think the China dimension is extremely important. Uh, there's a tendency um, among all of us here in this country to bash China uh, for its contribution, if you can call it that, um, to this problem. Um, you mentioned that carbon <coughs> intensity in China is rising. I happened to be reading a report in the New York Times just this past week that was written by uh, one of our graduates at Jackson Hole High School, um, Trevor Hauser, uh, who has become a senior advisor to the State Department um, on uh, climate change and participated in negotiations, um, indicating, based on his close reading of the figures, that carbon, we know that carbon emissions in China are increasing, but carbon intensity, in terms of the carbon intensity uh, relative to the gross domestic product of China, is actually decreasing in China. In 2012, it decreased 4.3%, which is significant. And they have, they actually have an energy policy in China. Uh, it's called a five, it's embedded within their five-year plan. And over the next four years, to 2015, they plan to reduce the carbon intensity of their economy by 16%. So they're actually on track to doing that. It's important, I think, in a policy sense, um, because um, too many policymakers in this country, in my view, use China's problem as an excuse for inaction here in the United States. And um, some of our policymakers right here in the state of Wyoming, representing us in DC, are saying, we can't really do anything because it doesn't make any difference because of what China's doing. Just wanted your comments on the fact that China, uh, despite its enormous challenges, is actually making progress uh, on these challenges. Well, it's a good point. Your figures and data is probably more up to date than mine, uh, but certainly their economy is growing, so their overall carbon is emissions are increasing. Uh, the carbon intensity thing, they are putting a lot of wind in, for instance. The Three Gorges Dam, uh, that's equivalent to something like a hundred conventional power plants, one dam. Uh, so that's that's low carbon, but may have its own environmental problems. But I think you're right, there's also, you know, it becomes politics, that's the, the whole global climate change thing, and that's an area that I, I have no understanding of or control of. But then there's a moral question as well, that here we are, a developed country, we can afford, even though we're not doing it, we can afford to pay more for energy and to convert. But what about India and China, where there are a lot of poor people that even a little bit of development would help their lives tremendously? And are we then going to say that, no, you can't uh, develop your economy that quickly because you're going to emit so much carbon because you can't afford the more expensive renewables. So there's there's a lot of very complex questions that are not just scientific, and that's the only part that I really know about. The, the moral and political things are another whole issue altogether. Yes, sir. First, I'd like to thank each each one of you for your presentations. I thought they were all three excellent. I just happened to see it in the newspaper and thought, that sounds interesting. I think I'll go. Uh, I enjoyed your uh, cartoon about uh, the deniers, you know, on the global warming thing. You know, we're all a product of our environment, and in 1970, I was a student at Arizona State University, and the big book back then that everybody was all scared about was called The Coming Ice Age, and it was about how pollution was going to shade the planet, and we were all going to freeze to death. And now the pollution is going to boil the planet to death. So, you know, I'm a bit skeptical on that. I've got to admit, I crunched the numbers a little bit on your presentation. You said the ocean levels could rise anywhere from 15 centimeters to 95 centimeters per year. Well, per century, that works out to half an inch to four inches per century. And uh, anyway, so I'm not really scared too much. Uh, well, of course, the sea level rise has been rather 
slow up until the fact that now we have this huge rise in warming. And there are what are called feedbacks. So the melting of the ice caps, which are now reflecting a lot of light back into space. A lot of energy gets reflected right back into space. But now the sea ice in the north is at historically low levels and not expected to recover. In fact, maybe even disappear in the next 40 years. It means that that energy, instead of being reflected back into space, is heating the sea in the north, which then means you don't get much ice, which means you get more, less reflection, which you get more heating. And so this, the, that global sea level rise is going to be following this temperature, and it really could be a meter or two of sea level rise by the end of this century. And that's a big deal when you live on the coast. So number one, and back in the 70s, when they were predicting cooling, they had just figured out those Milankovitch cycles, they're called. They, always, they figured them out in the 30s and the 40s, but they just figured out that there's these periodic ice ages. And we are close to what should be a, a maximum warm period. And we should actually, by the historical cycles, be heading towards another ice age. But we've completely turned that around into the other direction, into a very rapid heating. And also back in the 70s, what kind of computer did you have? <laughs> <laughs> so now they've got computers, and the models are getting better and better. They're putting the world's most powerful computers on this climate problem, and all of the predictions based on how much CO2 and methane we're going to put in the atmosphere are pretty substantial warm. I guess that's my point, is the predictions and computer models and computer graphics, well, we had thermometers back then, and, you know, projections don't mean as much as thermometers on the ground. By the way, welcome to Jackson Hole, this first time you've ever been here. You now have... <clears throat> You now have your ticket to get through the pearly gates. <laughs> when, you, when you arrive at the pearly gates, one of the questions St. Peter asks you is, have you ever been to Jackson Hole? And if you say no, he says, you go to hell. <laughs> well, as a religion professor, uh, <laughs> I, I will point out that prophecy is a, is a, is a chancy thing. And, and, uh, so the prediction of the future is, is never as certain as the prediction of the past. Um, uh, yeah.